Hornbill has taken Nagaland and if I may say so, India to the world. Full planned global city is being, uh, a, a master plan has been made of uh, Dimapur and Tumukadima. Once we attain peace, political stability and genuine peace across the land, we will have fantastic stories to tell, success stories to tell the world and contribute more to India's nation building journey. Hello and welcome to this special interview. We are here at the wonderful Nune Resort on the outskirts of Dimapur in Nagaland. To put up that crucial question, where is Nagaland headed? As the government, led by Chief Minister Nefurio, completes a year in office soon, we'll be talking about the state of economy, how the state is managing to bring in investments, what are its success stories, and where does work need to be done. We'll be talking about healthcare, education and a special focus on the youth of this state who are raring to go. What are the opportunities for them? Is it sports, startups, music, culture? What is in store for the state? Hello, Mr. Mehta. Thank you so much for speaking to East Mojo. This is a festive time and we are glad to be at this wonderful location. Thank you, Karma. It's always a joy talking to you. My greetings to you and the entire East Mojo family. And as I said earlier, this is the festive season as we head into a brand new year. And also, the government led by Chief Minister Nefrio completes one year in office. Well, almost. It is going to. Let's start with the festival of festivals, you know. It's known now, not just in India, but all around the world, the Hornbill Festival. And I was uh, lucky to be a part of the Hornbill Festival this time around. And it's wonderful to see people from across the country and the world come and see what Nagaland has to offer. Uh, what has been the biggest learning uh, for you? I know you've been doing it for some time, but what's the biggest learning for you? Well, you see, uh, the Hornbill Festival is part of our government's policy of the land of festivals. Our tourism policy, the slogan is land of festivals. We have so many tribes, dozens of tribes, sub-tribes, each tribe uh, commemorating its own festival, its own traditional festivals. So we have these mini hornbills in all the districts for all the tribes. Then it all culminates in the Hornbill Festival, which is called as the Festival of Festivals, the Hornbill Festival. It's now legendary. We're into its 24th year. So we've learned so many things on the way, 20 years of Hornbill Festival pushing brand Nagaland, taking Nagaland to the global stage. But you know, one of the most important things which we always remind ourselves to keep in mind is that the real stakeholders of this policy, this festival, are the people in the grassroots, the Naga people. Because it is our culture, our heritage, our vibrant way of life, the Naga way of life, which should be showcased to the world. That's the real stakeholder. And the, every citizen of Nagaland is a contributor and a participant in this festival. Hornbill festival is what it is because of the Nagas. Mm. So I'm told that, uh, you know, Mizoram, according to the latest estimates, had about one lakh tourists visit the state for a, in a year. And you have that footfall just for the Hornbill festival. So how do you take this already uh, popular festival and kind of, uh, you know, help it help Nagaland grow and go to a different stage when it comes to tourism? No, you see, uh, while we are also promoting and propagating our culture, celebrating our rich heritage, it is also an economic plan. We want to have positive economic impact. You are correct, we get almost more than a lakh people in a period of 10 days to come and experience the Hornbill Festival. And let me tell you, Hornbill is not just about Kisama and Kohima. We are having different events, hundreds of events, across six, seven districts. The Hornbill continues to grow, continue to expand. In fact, uh, if you try to make a booking for the coming Hornbill, you may find it difficult to get a room. So the, the fact of a Hornbill is that our intake capacity is to the brim. Every bed, every room is occupied. So we 
try constantly every year to increase rooms, to increase facilities and to take more. But the hornbill is big, it continues to get bigger and we do face challenges in maintaining the, you know, the standards and trying to improve the benchmark every year. There are challenges, there are lessons, there are improvements we have to keep making. It's a work in progress, mm. but yes, Hornbill has taken Nagaland and if I may say so, India to the world. Yeah, and especially Northeast India uh, to, to the world. You touched upon a very crucial subject there, the carrying capacity mm. of the state when it comes to handling tourists the quality hotels that are needed, the investments that are needed. Now, when it comes to tourism sector, you know the challenges you face during Hornbill. Huh? So how do you get more, uh, you know, hotels, bigger hotels, bigger, bigger hotel chains to come uh, into Nagaland when the laws, the traditional laws, the government, the, the, the government, the laws of the state don't allow uh, for land to be given to uh, these big hotel chains who might want to come and start their hotels here? Well, there are different ways to look at it. One, one aspect is that we are trying to promote hotels, better hotels, more comfortable hotels. But one thing Nagaland is trying to promote is experiential tourism. We want the tourists, the visitors, our guests to not only experience the culture and the events of the Hornbill Festival, but get into the heartland of Nagaland, to the hills, to the mountains, to the villages, to spend time with Naga families. Here is where Nagaland is trying to promote homestays. As I said earlier, the real stakeholders are the people in the grassroots. The economy of Nagaland's tourism policy, the economy of the Hornbill Festival must percolate down to the grassroots. They must be the real beneficiaries. So we're constantly trying to improve intake capacity by promoting homestays, upgrading the uh, various homestays that are in the villages, in the towns, in the different districts. So that's one area we're looking at it. At the same time, yes, investments in hotels, in resorts, in uh, comfortable places, trying to invite a, a chain, hotel chains to come in. That's a constant work in progress. We are hopeful that in the coming year, we will be able to make some breakthrough. Next year is the 25th year, the Silver Jubilee of Hornbill Festival. So the run up to the Silver Jubilee has already begun. But as I said, experiential tourism, the real pulse of the Naga people is in the villages, in the hills and the mountains. That's where we want our friends and our guests to get into. Any big hotel chains interested or planning something? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, we are already in talks with a uh, few hotel chains, private parties. This resort that we are in today, they are also in talks with uh, certain hotel chain to bring in bigger brands. But I think it's a little too early to uh, say which is coming in, which is not coming in. But I'm telling you, uh, early and middle part of next year, we may have some big announcements in place. So you said that you want the economic benefits that Hornbill, a festival like Hornbill Festival brings to percolate to the lowest strata of your society. Uh, have you succeeded in doing it? And what are the benchmarks that you say, okay, we've been successful in, in, in doing that? What are the outcomes that you're looking for? You see, uh, the Hornbill Festival, as I said, has hundreds of events over a period of 10 days. We did an independent economic impact study for the last few years. The last edition, over a period of 10 days, there was money spent by tourists coming from outside to the tune of 105 crores. We invest about 10 crores in conducting the events, public funds. 105 crores is the economic impact of people spending money during the Hornbill. And the report also says that there are more than 8,000 jobs that are created for the Hornbill Festival. So yes, it has an economic plan, it has economic benefits, but we also face challenges elsewhere. This year, one of the biggest challenges was traffic. We had massive traffic jams throughout the city and at Kisama. So these are lessons we learn. We hope to improve the traffic plan next year, the public transportation system. Hornbill Festival has to go green. It has to have responsible energy uh, usage. You know, it has to have a sanitation plan. So all these things are always a work in progress. One of the highlights of the Hornbill Festival is the Hornbill Music Festival. Mm -hmm. The Hornbill Music Festival is perhaps India's biggest, yes. if not one of the biggest in the entire region. This year, we had 40 bands, 800 musicians, six countries. And this year, another landmark was we had three major countries as partner countries of the Hornbill Festival. Mm. United States of America, Colombia, um, the United Kingdom and Germany. They were partner countries. I think this is a massive and significant development because for a government function like the Hornbill Festival to get partner countries of United States, Germany, Colombia and uh, other countries. For example, for 
America to be a partner country here, we have to understand that it needs the mandate of Washington DC. Yes. For Germany to be a partner country, it needs the mandate of Berlin. So I think these are big steps we are taking. We're pushing brand Nagaland through Hornbill Festival, internationalizing Nagaland and the Naga people and taking Nagas to the world. And do you think, my, this, this is the last question for this segment at least, uh, do you think that Hornbill Festival finally will be self-sustainable? By self-sustainable, I mean a time when the government doesn't have to uh, you know, fund the festival and the f uh, festival itself is able to generate funds? I think it's already self-sustainable in many ways. As I said, we're investing about 10 crores. That's just basic hand-holding. Everybody who's contributing towards the Hornbill, participating, organizing, event management groups, handloom handicraft, food, adventure sports, everybody has an economic plan. There's 105 crore that is being spent during the Hornbill. It's generating uh, employment, generating economy, creating money. And they, these event management groups and these entrepreneurs themselves are reinvesting in this, in their plan of, uh, you know, uh, promoting their own uh, brands. Mm. So yes, it continues to grow. It will become sustainable, self-sustainable, and it will ultimately contribute towards the growth of the Nagaland economy. Right. Uh, so this resort in itself, uh, uh, we are told, is around 300 acres. So there's lots of space to grow. These are the cottages. Uh, as we talk, we also want to uh, take you around the resort. So a very important question around the youth. Remember, the youth of Nagaland are raring to go. What are the opportunities for them? We'll ask that question ahead. So that was the log drum and we are at the wonderful uh, lake side restaurant, Jade restaurant, uh, which I am told was a challenge to build because all the water uh, from this pond had to be pumped out. Uh, let's talk about the other important challenge uh, for the state because uh, it has a very powerful base of its youth and the youth of your state are raring to go. Where are you taking them? We have a vibrant young population, energetic, innovative, creative, and as you rightly said, raring to go. In the past decades, we have been impacted by insurgency, by political instability. So the main employer for the youth was the government yes. service. Now we are trying to change the narrative. We are promoting entrepreneurship. We have been having years of farmer, product, uh, farmer promotion, youth empowerment, and now we are focusing on startups, we are focusing on uh, investments from corporate India, from outside India, so that employment opportunities are created. We are trying to generate engines of growth, be it in the service sector, in the farming sector, tourism, entertainment, sports. So youth activities is something this government is really focusing on. And we have to create employment through these verticals. Right. But the sad, sad fact is, and you know, we have been, all of us, in, in fact, together, have been fighting this for a long time, is that the insecurity of the youth, as you said, because of the years of insurgency and so many challenges, they find security in only government jobs. And I think to change that mindset is the biggest challenge. How do you change that? Right. Mindset? So the challenge is the mindset. Yes. We have to make these young people understand that there are more opportunities in the private sector. Supposing you are in the aviation sector, which we are trying to promote, you see the world. You meet people, you experience things which you don't when you're stuck up in a government job. And also, to climb the pyramid, there are more opportunities in the private sector, in entrepreneurship, in business, than in the government service. And the old mindsets, as you said, our parents, our previous generations thought government service was the best. Mm -hmm. But now more Naga youth are studying outside, they're getting exposure, they're meeting friends from around the world, and they themselves are coming and looking for opportunities and trying to create opportunities. So yes, we're trying to change the narrative away from looking for only government jobs. Right. The other focus areas that I've seen is talking about soft power is music, you know, which the state has always tried to promote. And there's a task force, there's a fixed budget to it. But do you think it's sustainable on the long run to have so many musicians, yet a very few, a fraction of them really, uh, you know, uh, uh, reach that pinnacle, the top? No, that's true. Like any other sector, be it sport, be it entrepreneurship, 
be it business, be it entertainment and music, it's difficult to reach the top. But let me tell you, the promotion, the vision of this government to promote music and the arts is succeeding. There are dozens of Naga musicians who are successfully pursuing uh, successful careers nationally, internationally. Our musicians are playing at national and international platforms. They're pushing brand Nagaland. Nagaland, Naga soft power is getting known through our musicians, our artists and our creators. And uh, today, Naga musicians are known all over the world. Nagaland is starting to get known for its uh, music capital. Kohima, Nagaland is today one of the music capitals of the country. Or uh, tomorrow we're going to have Sean Kingston, a big, big star coming to perform in Dimapur. The Hornbill Music Festival has a footprint of more than 10 lakh, 10 million social media footprint. So mm -hmm. yes, music is making a difference. And through the initiative of the Task Force on Music and Arts, we are breaking new ground, networking with corporate India, mm -hmm. getting sponsorships, platforms, sister festivals around the world. The musicians uh, from Nagaland are participating in music festivals in Italy, in Europe, in America, in Russia, Thailand, Vietnam. So opportunities are being created and they are having gainful employment. I am not saying it's a perfect situation, but we are making positive headway. Right. And, 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 and it's for them to grab that opportunity and maybe make something for themselves. Talking about grabbing opportunity, you are a functionary, uh, a, a very prominent one in the Sports Federation, yet your state is not doing so well yes. in sports. Even the Chief Minister said that, you know, they really have to catch on. Yet, we see lots of potential in the state, starting with just the wrestling, because it's in the DNA, you know, of the Naga people to wrestle. And they are athletic, but why aren't you doing well in sports and what are you doing to change this? You see, you and I will agree, Karma, that the Northeast is the talent bank of the country as far as sports is concerned. Northeast is giving maximum medals in Asian Games, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, World Championships around the world. Today, sports persons from this part of the country is contributing towards nation building, making India proud. But yes, unfortunately, Nagaland has not been so successful in the sports arena. When we talk about sports, we're going back to 1948. Yes. Dr. Tali Meren Ao being the first captain of independent India at the London Olympics in football. So yes, it's important to uh, get inspired by history, but we have to look ahead. We have to look forward and keep moving forward. As I said earlier, one challenge has been insurgency. And our youth, our government, our policymakers have been focused on political stability, insurgency, you know, the political movement. Now with peace, we are breaking new ground. We are not setting the stage on fire, but Nagaland is starting to win medals. In the, in the first uh, Northeast Olympic Games in Impal, we won 39 uh, medals. In the next edition in Shillong, Meghalaya, we won 80 medals. This year at the Goa National Games, for the first time in three editions, we won a handful of medals, including one gold medal. So the results are starting to come in. Also, you're talking about wrestling. We're going to popularize this Naga wrestling, the Naga style of wrestling, belt wrestling, which is becoming enormously popular across Asia. Recently, our wrestlers from Nagaland won medals at Asian Championships and will be hosting big ticket events in wrestling. And there is enormous potential in sports. We have the focus on infrastructure and an entire ecosystem of sport has to be developed. We're laying the foundation stones. We're getting there. And I'm telling you, champions will be produced. And will they get money? Yes. Today, a cricketer who represents Nagaland in Ranji Trophy, is getting 1,60,000 per match. We gave away cash awards of more than 50 lakhs to those winners who bought medals from the national games. We have a sports award system where you, you get medals in any event. There's a cash award waiting for you. We are going to introduce sports reservations in various services. Mm -hmm. Job opportunities will be created. Parents, schools, institutions will be made to realize that sport is today a professional field, no longer a recreation and a hobby. Right. So Nagaland is looking to sports and games as an area where our youth will do well, contribute to nation building and also make gainful careers. Right. And, and what about city building? What about Kohima as a smart city? Has it been a success? That is the question that is coming up next. So we are by the wonderful lake and I'm told there's a hatchery for prawns and all. Boating going on, so lot, lots of activities. So there will be some disturbance. 
but that will not uh, stop us uh, from talking uh, because we are now talking about Kohima, the capital city of Nagaland, which is facing a lot of issues uh, because it has a growing population. Smart city project for Kohima. Is it a success or is there lots to be done? Well, it depends on what success is, but I think it is successful so far because we've been able to take up some key developmental issues, address some of the challenges that Kohima has faced. But yes, there's a lot to be done. But you know what? Kohima is the only smart city project that the entire state of Nagaland has. Mm -hmm. And you know very well, Karma, Kohima is a historic city. You know, the cause of modern history changed there, the Second World War. If the Japanese invasion into Indian subcontinent was not halted at Kohima, perhaps the history of the Indian subcontinent would have been different. If the Japanese forces had reached Dimapur, where there was a railhead and an airport, they would have progressed into, advanced into the Indian subcontinent. But the Japanese invasion was halted at Kohima. Kohima is a historic city. History changed course there. So I think it's most appropriate that government of India also selected Kohima as a smart city. We've come up with many projects. The Capital Cultural Center, which you have seen, is a state-of-the-art facility. We're coming up with a star hotel facility. There are now two new multi-level parking facilities that can accommodate hundreds of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Streets are being widened, footpaths are being developed, but challenges remain. Like, for example, water supply. Mm -hmm. We are yet to solve the water supply problem for the citizens of Kohima. Traffic is always a problem, yeah. like any other hill, hill station, station in, the, yes. uh, in the country, but you know, uh, if you compare, you are from Sikkim, you have been to almost all the hill stations in Northeast and, and even up in North India. If you compare the streets and the roads of Kohima to the other hill stations, I think our roads are amongst the widest and best kept and cleanest. And one more thing, you don't hear concert of horns in the streets of Kohima. There mm -hmm. is silence, there is discipline and Kohima is well known throughout the country for the traffic discipline that it has despite the traffic challenges. So how will you evaluate success for the Smart City project? What will be that one, two or three things that you'll say, okay, Smart City has succeeded in no, my city? Evaluation of success is difficult, but in my book, the livability of the place, the good quality of uh, lifestyle that Kohima offers to you, be it in the services, electricity, yes. water supply, peace, stability. So these are some of the basic requirements to improve the livability. And as the city progresses, as it becomes more internationalized, city must also have services in the form of entertainment, clubs, getaways, good educational facilities. So these are some of the facilities we need. Kohima has now come up with a medical college. Good healthcare systems are there. They need to be improved, but they are on the way to improvement. There have been upgradations in the past. But livability is very important. And one of the biggest challenges, as I said, is traffic. If we can come up with a good transport, public transportation system, you see a lot of people talk about creating new roads, making new roads, making new parking spaces. But my study tells me that the best way to improve traffic problem or get rid of traffic problem anywhere in the world is to come up with a good transportation system, public transportation system. So the policymakers, the government, those in the seats of power will have to look at different models. Kohima will also have to go green. We may ha have to look at, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, public transport system that encourages people to stay away from their cars. Maybe we have to introduce cable car system. So these are some things the government is looking at and I hope that the smart city project can work towards those destinations. So for Kohima there definitely is a plan with the smart city project but your financial capital so to say not just of, uh, uh, of Nagaland but the region around it uh, because it supplies to and gets stuff from everywhere. Is there a plan for Dimapur? Because this is one city which has space to grow. You see, uh, Kohima is the state capital, is the seat of power. But Dimapur is the commercial headquarter. It is the commercial hub. It is not just a mini Nagaland, but it is also a mini India. Yes. And you are right, it, it, its perspectives are not just Nagaland, but the entire region. After Guwahati, perhaps the most important city in the Northeast. But now, the Dimapur narrative has also changed. We are looking at tremendous potential and scope in this region because we have inaugurated two new districts out of Dimapur that is Chumukadima district and Newland district. So it is now a tri-junction of three districts Dimapur, Chumukadima and Newland and this has tremendous potential and scope. Already it has a great advantage in connectivity. There's an airport is here, the railhead is here 
and the Trans-Asian Highway that connects the Indian subcontinent into the ASEAN cuts to the heart of these three districts. So there's tremendous potential. But we have to plan ahead because it is a competitive world. Dimapur also has to improve its livability. It has to improve infrastructure. But now with Chumukedima and Newland, part of the tri-district junction, I think there's tremendous scope for improvement. We have to improve infrastructure. Chief Minister Rio has announced that Chumukedima will be the education and sports city and district of the state. So these are new areas we're looking at. Beyond Chumukedima, we are looking at a new global city. We are trying to improve infrastructure, hotels, services, road network. There's a Dimapur bypass coming up. We are building new bridges. We are coming up with new healthcare facilities. So all these are being done so that Dimapur emerges as a commercial hub, not just in Nagaland, but for the whole region. Because Dimapur rising as a commercial hub, Dimapur becoming a logistical center is also important for the country. As India looks east, as India looks to tap into the ASEAN market, Dimapur is going to play a crucial role. And here is where the state government has definitive plans of improving infrastructure. And here we are hopeful that the people of the state will come forward, extend cooperation, and we will move collectively towards that aspiration. Right. So for all of this to happen, the one thing that is needed is money. Uh, so our next question, of course, will be around investments. Nagaland as a state has got unique challenges. So we'll be talking about that next. And now we are angling, at least I'm trying to because I have no idea at all what this is and how it works. Never done it in my entire life. Hope it bites. Talking about biting, uh, the question that I'm going to ask uh, here is about investments. You know, um, The state cannot really stay forever uh, without uh, private investments, big equity investments and the state needs that. You talked about this being the gateway to Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, maybe the food processing hub, you know, opportunities are endless. But how are you getting in investments into the state? You see, uh, as chairman of the Investment and Development Authority of Nagaland, in the past few months, I've been observing, studying, analyzing the various aspects of investment in the state. We recently, last year, we had a CSR summit where we could generate a few hundred crores to come into the state that is through CSR initiatives but we need big ticket investments in various sectors here again the service sector tourism sports youth entertainment skill development and startups these are some of the areas where we're looking at investments but we face challenges because of uh, rules laws 371a these are challenges which sometimes come in the way of investments. So the government is also looking at possible modification of certain laws, certain rules relaxed for uh, selected areas and pockets where we can have special development zone. The uh, government is planning a global city. And we are also giving hand-holding offers, tax relaxations and special offers to certain verticals where investments can come in. Without investments, we cannot make progress and we have to give confidence to the investors to cooperate in India. Mm -hmm. There are other areas which we have to look at because Nagaland also has to generate its own revenue. Mm -hmm. Oil exploration is one. We've run into some hurdles. Government is under negotiation. Chief Minister is making serious efforts and the government of India is also helping us try to overcome those hurdles. Mm -hmm. So once we break those hurdles, we are hopeful that we can generate some revenue through oil exploration and revenue sharing with Assam. Another area we have to look at is perhaps prohibition, how to relax that, how to improve tourism. So these are some areas and big ticket investments in the form of corporate India, multinational companies coming and investing in hotels, in services, in uh, manufacturing, in startups. So these are some of the areas we've been working on and hopefully in the next 12 months we'll be able to announce some positive news. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, you, you said a global city. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on what this global city is? So a full planned global city is being uh, 
a, a master plan has been made of uh, Dimapur and Chumukedima where we will give special uh, relaxation of laws so that uh, corporate companies, manufacturing hubs can come in, make investments, partner with local entrepreneurs, local people on PPP modes, different models. And it will be a global city that focuses on education, healthcare, uh, tourism, manufacturing, you know, mm -hmm. and even back offices for major companies. Right. Um, the other point that you stressed on is startups. Now, again, with startups comes a lot of challenges. Again, 377, the laws that are there. Um, how do you see the youth overcoming this? And are there any great startups stories that are happening in the uh, in, in the state right now? Yeah, in fact, uh, Startup Nagaland is actually already doing quite well. There are a number of companies which are doing successfully well economically. Recently, we had a meeting with the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory uh, Panel. Uh, members of uh, the PM's ESE came to Nagaland. We had series of deliberations. Yeah. Then we also had a team of uh, experts go to Delhi, spend a couple of days with the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory team and discuss ideas. One of the main focus areas was startups. You know, interestingly, they were so impressed by one of our startups that is our uh, drone manufacturing and drone GIS system which is doing very well and the PM's office is impressed and uh, even the Niti Aayog is impressed. So we're hoping for some investments there and it becomes a model for everybody. We also had uh, dedicated uh, discussions with foreign delegations. Uh, recently, I held a, chaired a meeting of a roundtable business delegation with a German team and an American team. And they're very keen to explore startups in Nagaland, support, hand-holding, extend uh, mentorships. These are some areas we're looking at and I hope that with this international participation, our startups uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, creators will be able to make some breakthroughs. We certainly hope that... Uh, you we, know, are also, we are also coming up with a startup hub and innovation center under my ministry and we are mentoring them, hand-holding them, bringing resource persons, experts to, you know, uh, uh, sort of have a guardian uh, program for them so that they c are sensitized for the challenges that lie ahead. Right. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we saw and it is around the same ecosphere, the same ecosystem is connectivity, internet connectivity. And we saw the digital divide very painfully during the COVID period when at East Mojo we highlighted stories in villages where the children simply did not have access to internet and they had to climb mountains to, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to study. How do we overcome this challenge? That uh, challenge continues to be, uh, you know, uh, something we face constantly. Covid was a time when, you know, these online classes yes. started even for schools and many of them could not. And we need good internet service. Today we live in an age that is dependent on the knowledge economy, connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, bandwidth. So Nagaland also having struggled with this, we are taking up with Government of India. Ministry of Information and Technology, BSNL is improving in infra its infrastructure. We are reaching out to private companies also, to how to improve connectivity in the state. It's a constant challenge. It's not the best. And we keep uh, reminding the government of India that they have to help us to improve connectivity if our youth are to be on par with the rest of the country. Government is taking this up very seriously. I myself am pursuing this personally. So yes, this is one challenge, but we need to let the government of India and the Corporate India, the uh, telecom companies, the internet service providers have to understand that they have to give good services in these far corners of the country. If you are talking about nation building, you have to start from the far corners. Prime Minister Modi has said, India will not develop unless Northeast is developed. So corporate India, those companies which give services to the country have to understand that they have to start from the far corners. Right. And, and finally, for all of this to happen, uh, you know, the peace talks, the accord, that has to be done and dusted. I guess the entire state is looking forward uh, to this and it's taking a long time. Nagaland has so much potential. Nagaland has contributed greatly towards India's nation building story. And we can make so many more contributions. In the last few years, decade and a half maybe, we have seen relative peace with the signing of the ceasefire. Yeah. And you know, there's peace talks going on. Yeah. And we have already seen a lot of progress because of the ceasefire and the peace talks. But we need to seal the deal. Yes. We need a permanent and long-term solution. The peace process must end in a logical and honourable manner so that we have a political solution to the Naga issue. And once that happens, I'm telling you, the sky is going to be the limit. Because even with this challenge, our youth, 
Naga youth are writing stories of success all over the world, all over the country. And once we attain peace, political stability and genuine peace across the land, we will have fantastic stories to tell, success stories to tell the world and contribute more to India's nation building journey. And yes, as you said, despite the challenges, there are so many success stories around the world. Thank you so much, Mr. Abu Mehta, for speaking to us. And as with my angling, uh, we certainly hope that Nagaland catches up very soon at breakneck speed with the rest of India and the rest of the world.